the $700 stock and then there's others out there that, well, uh, keep wishing and keep hoping. One day maybe, but you never know. It's already been there and done that and since then the margins have been coming down. So, what keeps Apple alive? It's its dividend. That's another point we're going to learn today. Why is Apple paying out a large dividend? It's another interesting principle, that is equity part of the balance sheet costs organisations money more than the debt part of the balance sheet. We're going to learn about that. So today is a bit about valuation. How many of you have done valuation or study in valuation? Anyone? Currently or already done? Currently. Currently, okay. So today is we're going to marry valuation with the R and RAP. Can we use the information that you get from doing your valuation course and put it into an incentive system for a divisional manager and that's what we've got about that's what we're talking about today. That's what chapter 10 is about. It is using all those instruments of valuation. You, look, here's all your valuation instruments here. You don't need to do a calculation, it's already calculated for you on the internet. Let's have a look. What's another favourite stock of yours? Royce, I hear you say Facebook. Oh, just by the way, we've got Facebook here too. We've got return on assets, 7.75%. 7.75% return on assets. Operating margin, 31%. Okay, interesting. The unknown is when will the insiders sell more and how much more distribution has to occur in terms of institutions buying in to this uh, miracle, which some people call it. All right, what about Google? Been around on the block for over eight years and it's gone up 900%. Why is it staying up over eight hundred dollars? Why isn't it over a thousand dollars? They hope it'll go to two thousand within two or three years' time. But here's the point you want to look at: uh, we've got return on assets, eight point nine percent, not very high. Remember, Apple is high teens, and let's have a look at the operating margin, twenty-three point nine five percent. Okay, these are all numbers that are readily available in the company system. And this is one reason, or the big rationale for chapter 10, why we may make divisional managers responsible for them. And the purpose, the whole purpose is how, how can we add value to the organisation? It's all we want to do. How can we add value? Using uh, R in the RAP results controls plus a very cheap measure very cheap measure what's a cheap measure here? Oh, accounting <laughs> accounting alright results from a cheap measure and hopefully we get some kind of alignment alignment of what divisional managers do, what investment centre managers do, what profit centre managers do with overall value enhancements of the organisation. So we want divisional managers to make choices that are congruent with value adding operations in the organisation. Let's go back to the PowerPoint shall we because I want to take you through, I think the Apple is pretty, pretty cool. Google's even great. Google's awesome. I love Google. Made some money on it last night. Okay, let's have a look. All right, so we have the financial performance effects. Uh, please don't act on my recommendations, okay? Not meant to be advice and taken seriously, okay? for teaching and learning purposes. Okay, financial responsibility centres. Summary measures, there are three types of measures here. We've got summary measures, that is market, accounting measures, and we've got number three is a combination of measures. Really funny, they call the third one a combination, which is these two here, plus non-financial measures. Oh, by the way, here's, I love this part, and we're going to get into that next week, especially when we start talking about strategy. We start talking about we start talking about 
the customer. Yes, why didn't we talk about a customer early? Well, we're going to get to the customer. At least we end with a customer. And you know, uh, normally our memories, our recency effect, we always think of the last things we learnt, so at least I'm teaching you the most important thing last, the customer. Okay, someone suggests I should mention the customer at the start. I said, no, we'll get to the customer. We'll get to the customer, and this is where we are. Here we are now in chapter 8, 9, 10. We're in financial responsibility centers. You know it's a big section. Then we go into another section, but that ends your book. Now you're going into my section now, where I'm going to tell you all about strategic responsibility centers and how that can work. That's next week, but we're just ending up here. We did transfer pricing last week. Size. Remember, size is the reason why we develop financial responsibility centers. Size created knowledge transfer costs. You know, the costs of moving information from local right up to central, missed decision opportunities, missed market opportunities, okay? Not knowing the people, not knowing the system, not knowing the customer, all those things that you need to know to execute strategy perfectly is not optimized as you get larger and larger and larger and larger because someone asked me, what is knowledge transfer costs? Knowledge transfer costs are missed opportunities. Knowledge transfer costs is information overload. They, you make a bad decision because you're trying to think of too many things at the same time. And you really need people to help you, okay, to delegate decisions to. That's what we mean by knowledge transfer costs. It's not theory, it's actually real, they're real missed opportunities that a company has as it gets larger. And that's why it's forced to decentralize. Then you've got financial responsibility centers. Then you've got transfer pricing, which you all went through. You all, are. you all went through transfer pricing. And you were examined on it, so you all know about it. And then next week, well, let's have a look at customer and let's look at the business again from a strategic responsibility center point of view. So you all know where we are, you know where we're going. And I think the thing that's common between financial responsibility centers and strategic responsibility centers is how can we add value to the organization? How can we add value to the organization? And fortunately, when we're talking about summary measures, I can take your learning from valuation. You've been studying valuation. By the way, I taught corporate governance, corporate governance, no, corporate finance for four years. Okay, so we taught about five, six, seven, eight times over four years. So I can tell you a few stories or a few of those ideas come into what we're going to talk about today. There are two types of measures, as I just said. Marketing and accounting. As you know from chapter four, accounting is precise and objective. Remember the horizontal line? Remember those four targets? What was on the vertical axis? What property of accounting? What was it? What was the property of counting on vertical axis? The property of measurement. Specificity, sensitivity. Yes, that's it. You know that. You know that because I asked you just to remember two, and therefore you're able to remember two rather than all five. Okay? Here are the, here is the vertical axis. Axis precise objective. Now, congruent. You know congruent. That means everything's in a line. That is, I'm making decisions that are congruent with the head office decision making. Hopefully, accounting forces managers to do that. But we're going to look at examples today where that does not happen. It does not always happen. Accounting is cost effective. What do we mean by that? Well, the system's already in there. Why? Because we have to do reporting. We have to have our businesses audited. We have to file tax returns. So the accounting system's there. So let's just use those numbers to attach incentives to and targets to to make divisional managers responsible for. That's why, uh, what we mean by cost effective. Okay, let's, um, one more. Congruence, just explain that. We're talking about alignment. Getting divisional managers to make the same decisions as the head office. But that doesn't always happen as you'll show as I'll show you in a minute. Feasibility. We're talking about the cost benefit operations. Market measures are not available for either privately held firms or wholly owned subsidiaries. So sometimes accounting measures are useful, market measures are not. <coughs> controllability. Here's the big thing about controllability. That is when you go 
you've got top of the organisation, then you've got the various divisions, and then the subdivisions under there. As we go further down, the controllability comes closer to 100%. It pays to have an RAP system, a results action uh, personnel control system, that focuses on 100% controllability because employees will leave if they feel they're under too much stress and you want them to focus on doing the things you do. But for a divisional manager level, knowledge transfer costs and everything else may cause you to say, look, I'm happy for them to have 70% controllability. Managers, you deal with that other 30%. Find a way to deal with that uncertainty. I'm paying you big money. You get a big bonus if you beat the ROI or the return on investment or the profit center target. So that's the risk I'm compensating you for. You see, different deal. At the divisional level, controllability is not as big a deal as it is for people on the lower level of the organization. At the lower level, it's all about operational excellence, operational task execution. Okay. Here, it's all about strategy execution. And it's about working out how do you respond to the environment when competitors change, when customers change. So there's always going to be less than 100% controllability as you get higher up in the organisation. That's part of the deal of being a divisional manager. So let me ask you the question, do you want to be a divisional manager? Really? Okay. All right. Anyone else want to be a divisional manager? Okay, not interested. All right, let's see if let's see what I can do to help you here. Okay, so we've got limitations here. Notice this is the first time in the chapter and in the slides that the word value is used. Yes, it's value. Value is obtained by discounting future cash flows of the entity. Now that's a bit of corporate finance coming in here. We're going to talk about that in the from the point of view of the weighted average cost of capital. By the way, how many of you have done your corporate finance elective yet? Anyone? Not yet. You have? Corporate finance, financial management, business finance. No one? Have you done capital asset pricing model? You've done asset valuation. You've done bond valuation. You've done the beta. You've done the calculation of the average cost of capital. You've worked out the efficient market frontier, no? Hey, I've taught all this. I could teach it to you if you need help. Okay? So don't tell me you don't know it. I think you do know it. So we're going to go over some of those issues. But here is the big question. Myopia. How many of you have done another, uh, another elective called optometry? Anyone? So what does myopia, if you have myopia in your eyes, what does that mean? Yeah, short-sighted. Okay, so myopia here in chapter 10, meaning that the financial numbers that you force managers to try and hit causes them to think short-term or long-term? Short-term. Okay, great. Now you know what that is. You're awesome. All right, so there are different ways of working out performance measures for profit centers or for various strategic business units. You can have return on investment, residual income, these are the two most commonly used numbers. So let's have a look at some of the other labels. There's return on equity, return on capital employed, re net return on assets, return on net assets. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's, let's be careful. We're just, all we're talking about is a basic balance sheet. On this side, we have assets. Wow, you know that because you've done first year accounting. We have equity. What else do we have on this side? Yeah, we have debt. Okay, and normally, normally we think, oh, okay, debt, what's the cost of financing? Go to the bank and they'll tell you maybe between 5 and 12%, even more in some industries or even less than others. All right, what about equity? How much does that cost? You have to derive it, right? 
by using something like the capital asset pricing model with the efficient market frontier, that definitely, depending on the market, your company's beta, then you can work out some coin, kind of cost of equity. And then you look at the percentage of the equity, percentage of debt, you multiply that by the interest rate, multiply that by the interest rate, and then you're going to get a weighted average cost of capital. You all know that, no? You all know that. It's coming back to you. I can see you all nodding. Great. Love it. Love to see you all nodding at half past two in the afternoon. Beautiful afternoon. Sun is shining and we're looking at ROI. Isn't it great to be in the class? We got numerator, we've got dominator, we've got suboptimization. So let's have a look at some numbers. I want you to take away these numbers because this is your big challenge for today. I want to show you how, how we set up. Division, divisional managers to hit certain numbers can cause them to make suboptimal decisions. And the first example, before we talk about the example, I'll tell you about the different scenarios. We have five strategic business units, A, B, C, D and E. We have the cash receivable, it's inventories, fixed assets, total investment, profit, return on investment, no? Alright, see the table at the bottom? I want you to imagine we cut this table out, right? We cut it, let me pick it up, and we put it here, all right? So basically this is an extension of this at the top, okay? So we've got those five going across here, okay? So notice the profit here, 24 down to 1.8, 24 down to 1.8, and then we're coming across again. Now we've got current assets, and there's the required earnings. There's a 4% cost of capital for current assets. Fixed assets required earning 10% cost of capital for fixed assets. Okay, and then we have residual income. All right, now we've got those numbers, we're going to play some games. The first game is this, notion, this algorithm where if we have a corporate cost of capital, okay, let's be very clear here, the corporate cost of capital is that hurdle, all right? Do you know what this is? Do you know what this is? That's a river, okay? And there's, and that's a dam, okay? Between two mountains, all right? Now the corporate cost of capital is that the height of that damn wall, okay? And if the water can't get over, then we don't want to invest in that investment. If it gets over, then we know it's adding value to the organisation. See that? You with me? That's what we mean by corporate. So here it's 10%. Here it's 10%. Got nothing to do with the divisions. This is overall value adding to the shareholders. Right, so if the business unit, that is one of those, A, B, C, D or E, if their return on investment is 20%, then they may reject an opportunistic investment, a, an investment that's valued to the organisation. Why? Because it's higher than that damn war. All right? Whereas another business unit, D, ROI is 5%, they may accept a project that is not value adding to the organisation as a whole. You see? So, the individual status of the divisions can get in the road of centrally optimizing investments for the organization as a whole. Let's have a look. So we have cost of capital 10%. We have an investment of 10% earned $1.1 per year. And so, I'll go to the first manager, Division A. Say, would you like to invest in this investment? It's $10, I'm going to give you $1.10 income after one year. Would you like to invest in it? And the manager from SBUA says, hmm, 11% return. Mm, if I add that to my other numbers in my, in my division, that's going to reduce my return on investment from 20% down, below 20%. Uh-uh, that's not for me. That's not for me. Oh, okay. Let's try division D. D. Say, Division D manager, would you like to invest in this? I have a great investment for you, $10, 11% return, it's going to get $1.10 per year. 
would you like to invest? And that division manager said, wow, 11%? Wow, currently I'm only earning 5%. That's going to improve my bottom line. It's going to improve my incentives. Sure, I'm going to take that investment. And so now you have Unit C and D deciding, yes, they will invest in this investment. But Unit A said, oh no, that's not for me. Same investment. Same investment for the organisation that's beneficial for the organisation. So these two are right from the corporate point of view. Those two are right from the damn war or can we add value to the organisation point of view. But this unit is wrong. It's optimising the division's wealth, but not the overall corporate wealth. Let's have a look at how we can prevent that. Let's have a look at another sub-optimisation problem. Let's, corporate cost of capital, 15%. Wow, 15%. Now, let's go to Unit C. Unit C. Would you like to have this $10 with a $10 investment, $1 10 return in 12 months, 11%, do you want it? And Unit C says, oh, mm, okay, our current return is 10%, 11%, yes, we'll take it, because that's better, it's going to improve our numbers for my bonus period. They'll invest. Unit D will also invest because it's greater than their current ROI. But Unit A will say, mm mm, that's not for me, 20%. Uh uh, it's below my threshold. So who's right and who's wrong? In this case, these two units are wrong because that 11% return is less than what is needed to get over that damn wall, to get over that 15%. You see that? Unit A is right, it just so happens that their ROI is much closer to the overall corporate weighted average cost of capital. Can you see that? It just so happens they're up there so they both make the right decision. So that's what I mean by sub-optimization, we've got the same investment but different divisions are making different decisions. An optimal investment or an optimal algorithm will be if they make the same decision for every investment. How can you do that? That's the big question. One way of doing that is in terms of setting up a residual income. That is, you put a wall in place and then anything above that wall will be counted towards an absolute profit for the division. So now it's not the 20%, 10% or 5% ROI that becomes the basis for the decision. The new basis for the decision is the current profits of Unit A, do they go up or down after accepting the investment? Yes they do, 15.6 to 15.7. Unit C, 5.7 goes up to 5.8. Unit D, minus 1.6, now it's minus 1.5. And so each of these units are going to say yes, yes, yes. They're all on the same page. And that's the argument in Chapter 10, to say that, look, residual income is better than overall return on investment because it gets or divisions, no matter what their current performance is, to make the same decision for the benefit of the organisation. When we say for the benefit of the organisation, make a decision that adds value to the organisation. All we want to do is add economic value to the organisation. A few points to note. Notice we've got 25.1 minus 2.4 minus 7. That minus 2.4 is the 4% times current assets. That 7 is the 10% times fixed assets. Remember, Unit A had $60 of fixed assets, right? So how come it's 7? 10% of 60 is 6. How come it's 7? Oh, 60 plus that 10% investment makes it 70. Times it by 10%, there's your 7 there. 
You see that? There's our calculation, what we're doing. Exciting stuff. So that's what we mean by sub-optimization. And there's some calculation there. Another point, notice how notice how we have 4% charge on the current assets, 10% charge on the fixed assets. That makes sense? Because the fixed assets are long.